Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. I'm Bernard Johnson, the MD. And it's a really great privilege for me to report another year of good results to all our shareholders, employees, and stakeholders. It's been a tough year for everyone. We all know that. And I feel bond to say a big thanks to all concerned in our operation not only the shareholders, but the suppliers, our employees, and especially our employees who have stuck with us through thick and thin. As you probably know, we've had a good result, both top and bottom sales have been good for 2021, and the bottom line has continued to improve. This is probably the 15th year we've delivered good growth, not exceptional growth, I suppose, but it's good, and we hope to continue that. This year, we've generated quite a lot of cash, and we delivered on our aspirations to exceed 60 million turnover by the end of 2021. On this basis, we want to sustain and increase the momentum of growth and profitability, both organically and, and most importantly, by acquisition. Acquisitions are planned and will be financed using the cash generated internally, together with bank funding and aiming our financial director will take you through that. He has negotiated quite a useful facility with our banks. Our acquisitions will include brands on digital platforms as well as brands with bricks and mortar presence. This is a key in our forward strategy. Our manufacturing, warehousing and green investments will continue and will uh, be matched by growth in efficiency, capacity, and we do all this by releasing land, which will be sold and finance this investment. We will introduce Nick Coleman, our head of global operations, and he will introduce himself and outline our strategy. Nick is the missing link. I hope he takes that the right way. But we have been looking for someone to lead us into the next generation of manufacturing efficiency, capacity, uh, and automation. And Nick has got that kind of experience global experience and a pretty diverse experience across the uh, health and beauty business. We intend to strengthen and upgrade our management structure and improve our delivery of training and personnel development and leadership training. So I think that's all I wanna say at this stage, guys, I'll be uh, summing up and expressing our aspirations after uh, Eamon has presented uh, the financials and Pippa has presented the marketing. So over to Eamon, thank you. Thanks, Bernard. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so I'd like, I'd like to start just by introducing the uh, financial highlights to what has been a very successful financial year. Um, the headlines, revenue increased by 13.8 million to 61.6, a corresponding increase also in, in operating profit, which uh, is up to 5.4 million. Uh, EBITDA increased up to 6.9 million from 5.1 Profit before tax up to 5.2 million, eight, representing 8.4% of sales. And profit after tax is up to 7% compared to 6.6% last year. So we've seen a similar increase in earnings per share up to 5.89 in fully diluted earnings per share. And we're proposing a, a final dividend, uh, same as last year, of 0.5 per ordinary share. And we've increased our net cash in hand, and I'll cover that in a little bit more detail later in the presentation, by 3.4 million up to 6.2 million. So just looking at the top line overview, you can see the trend over the last five years. So we're up to 61.6 million. You can see the trajectory there over the last five years. Uh, people will be going through the revenue and the sales analysis in, in some detail. So, but just to, just to touch on the highlights, if I may. So, obviously the top line up to sixty one point six. We've seen the own brand sales, which is our brands excluding hygiene, have increased by sixteen percent in the year. Obviously, hygiene sales were a big factor in the current year which accounted for 14.6 million in sales. And we did see a small decline in private label and contract sales uh, due to the, mainly to the effect of the pandemic and store closures. 
So a very positive top line situation uh, on the back of some strong sanitizer sales. So those higher sales have translated themselves into uh, a similar increase in operating profit. You can see we posted 5.4 million in operating profit for the year compared to 3.8 million last year. Probably just worth calling out here the effect of COVID. Bernard has alluded to the tremendous efforts of everybody really to keep the factory going, uh, to keep the sales going, to keep the materials supplied, keep our customers satisfied. And so we have seen the positive top line, as we said, on the back of the um, hand sanitizer sales of 14.6 million. But it's worth recalling um, there was some significant internal costs as well there of in the, in the region of 1.6 million. Basically, costs we have incurred in keeping employees safe, maintaining social distancing, uh, costs uh, associated with uh, air freighting in certain cases, goods goods um, to keep supply going, um, maintaining safety, uh, testing on site. So um, it wasn't all one-way traffic, I suppose, from the point of view of COVID. So there's positives and, and some costs as well. So again, just to re reiterate the thanks uh, to everybody who was associated in helping us get through what has been a challenging year. So the operating profit margin, again, continues to grow. You can see 8.8%, which is operating profit as a percentage of sales. And you can see there the trajectory over the last five years. And really what you're seeing there is the growth in top line basically delivers a higher operating percentage. And EBITDA, just really to record EBITDA, EBITDA is earn, earnings before interest tax, depreciation and amortization. So it's an indication of the, of the amount generated uh, from operating activities within the business. Obviously, you strip out the, the interest and the depreciation and amortization, you get, you get a, an indication of the, ca of the cash generation. So you can see, again, a similar, similar increase we see there in EBITDA up to 6.9 million in the current year. And really just, just to record the depreciation and amortization charges that are included in our, our P&L there of 1.1 million and 0.5 million. Diluted earnings per share, again, uh, same inc increase in earnings per share. We're up to 5.89 million in the uh, current year, which is 35.7% increase compared to March 20. And compared to uh, March 17, a 213% increase Um and, and just make a historical note there, some of those historical years, there was an R&D tax credit claimed, which is, uh, had, had a, a depressive effect in some of the earlier years and, and corresponding increase in, in some of the later years. That's what you're seeing there on, so, on some of those years, the 17, 18 and the 18, 19 slide. So return on capital employed, again, uh, which is basically operating profit expressed as a percentage of capital employed, which is the amount of capital in the business, including debt. And we're measuring that at 22.4% in the current year compared to 19% in the previous year. I should just note that uh, when, the, when the first version of the uh, preliminary announcement came out, there was a reference to 29% there, but it was actually it is actually 19% uh, uh, return on capital for the previous year. And that's up now to 22.4%. So our, our reserves are up to 20 point million in our balance sheet, which I think is indicative that we have potential, good potential for growth and acquisition opportunities. So just to talk about cash, because everything ends up in cash. And really, this is this is just a summary of the cash, the cash flow for the business March 21 and March 20 side by side. And uh, you can see it starting at, at the top, the profit from operations of 5.3 million. There's non-cash movements, which is mainly depreciation and the amortization. We had an increase in the working capital as, as the business increased towards the end of the year of 0.9 million. I paid the tax during the year. Um, we have net cash generated then from operating activities of 5.5 million. And then we paid out a million in CapEx, 200K in interest, and repaid some of our borrowings on the mortgage and others, paid the dividend of 400K, uh, which gave us an increase of 2.879 cash in the year and left us with a closing cash. This is cash and cash equivalents. So it's gross before, before short-term borrowings of 6.558 compared to 3.670. So in summary, a very good year from, the, from a cash generation point of view, uh, good control of, over, over working capital and leaves us well-placed to take advantage of uh, future opportunities. So the working capital 
is demonstrated on this page. Um, so the cash and cash equivalents up by 2.9 million, as we've seen. Stock turn, which is an indication of how fast our stock uh, turns to our business. So you can see in the current year, 4.4 uh, compared to 3.6 in the previous year. So it's just a, it's a good indication of the activity in the business. A, a lot of that is down to the uh, very high level of hand sanitizer. So you can, you can imagine we were bringing in the stock and churning it through pretty quickly. And that's reflected in that high 4.4 stock turn number. And on the debtors, again, pleasing to report that on average debtor days are 52 days outstanding and 54 compared to the previous year. And you can see the trade receivables increased uh, at the end of the year to 9.8 compared to 8.6 million in the current year. I probably should just, just say, and I think we've, we've said it elsewhere, but we do have a policy now to credit insure all our debts, uh, which is, which is, in, which is uh, in place. So just this is a, a recap, uh, really, of the aspirations that were stated in 2017, which were stated to be 60 million by the end of 2021, 5% net profit after tax, 2% dividend, return on capital employed of 20%. So all of these have been achieved, uh, with the exception of the uh, dividend of 2%. And I think we're, at this stage, we're now a significantly bigger business than we were in 2017, as you've seen from those charts, uh, with an ambitious management team keen to develop new sales and profit opportunities. So our intention is to continue to invest in the development of our people, sustainable production capabilities, and are open to the acquisition of new brands, especially with a digital presence. So... That, con that concludes the overview uh, from the finance um, presentation. So I'd like to hand you over to Pippa, who will uh, talk in more detail about the sales. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to start out this section uh, this time round for a recap for those that know us well and possibly an introduction for those that are first time with us on how we define ourselves, who we are, and how we've evolved over the past few years in terms of the structure and the approach that we take to our business. At our core, our mantra is quality, service, and innovation. And these are three qualities that no matter what the function is in the business or what we do, that we keep at the heart of everything that we do. That, along with our three pillars of brands, private label, and contract filling, that enables us to have flexibility and agility in the market, which I'll explain a little more in terms of how that has helped us through managing through the ups and downs of the pandemic over the past year. Our goal is always to have a very wide and diverse offering to our customers and the channels that we work in. And I think we've achieved that over the past few years by supplying everybody in the discount value sector from Aldi up to premium retailers like Space NK. And that very much is still a goal of ours to keep that spread of both channel and customer coverage very wide and diverse. We're anchored in ensuring that we are always focused on the consumer and using both trends and data to work on solutions for our customers, whether that be in private label or contract manufacturing or in developing our brands. And again, is very key to the heart of everything that we do coupled with wanting to ensure that we are always flexible and agile with regard to what we can manufacture and what we can develop. And examples are, as many of you know, we manufacture products like powdered talc all the way through to premium skincare. So I just wanted to outline again, and like I said, those that know us well will know that this is the heart of, of how we define ourselves, but it was, it was just an opportunity at this juncture and where we are in our growth to kind of revisit that this is still very much what leads us and what is key in our business in terms of driving us forward. Division performance for the financial year 2020 to 2021 has shifted quite considerably with the pandemic and the opportunity and hygiene with our brands shifting brand into a position of 43% of our total business, private label at 37% and contract at 20%. As previously mentioned, by Eamon in the financials, both private label and contract through the financial year have taken a small hit that is directly connected to the pandemic and either retailers not performing or brands that we manufacture not performing. And I'll, 
go through a bit more detail of that in a minute. Taking hygiene out of the equation, which has very much been a big one-off trading opportunity during this financial year, our core brands still continue to perform up 16%, representing 26% of, of the total performance, division performance. So just a little more detail on that. Again, alluded to the fact that private label and contract have taken a little bit of a hit this year. Private label has been a mixed bag insofar as that because our spread with retailers is so diverse, we had some retailers perform exceptionally well during the pandemic. So high street retailers taking the biggest hit, fashion retailers particularly because they were, they were locked down. But grocery and discount grocery performing very, very well in private label. They really picked up the slack in terms of availability of health and beauty products to the consumer. So did very well for us in private label, particularly in the core products that we do in baby and in basic skincare. We saw those categories perform very, very well during the period. Contract manufacturing, again, a little bit of a mixed bag. We got hit by pr premium brands who really slowed down during the period. They effectively just put on hold orders that they had for a period of time as they were adjusting to either moving themselves or online or helping to return to bricks and mortar. Um, however, we have some really strong Mastige customers that we manufacture for, and they did very well during the period. Hence, contract manufacturing only took a slight hit in terms of a downturn during the pandemic year. Brands, as I've highlighted, however, have done very well. So whilst we did benefit from £14.6 million worth of sales into the NHS and into retail, the core brands that we have on the market also did very, very well. And again, much like private label, that's a demonstration of the spread that we have in retail. And the brands that we had listed in the value sector, discount grocery, and the grocery sector performed very, very well for us during the period. Category performance is really in line with what's happening in the market. And I think this is why this is important to highlight. Facial skincare has been very strong for us for a couple of years, and you can see has developed yet again during the 2021 financial year. As highlighted, that's been driven by private label and also been driven by our branded ranges that we have in facial skincare. You'll see the big peak there for hygiene. Do not anticipate that repeating in any way, shape or form. The market, as you no doubt have heard, is, is definitely hygiene weary. Retailers are still very overstocked. Um, the NHS is very overstocked and consumer demand for hygiene products has um, decreased quite significantly since the peak. However, body skincare is doing very, very well. Um, it was a category that was coming on much stronger pre-pandemic, but the pandemic has also allowed that category to develop very well in line with well-being and self-care, which are very key trends that have evolved during the pandemic. Hair care continues to perform very well as well, as well as baby. And these four categories are predominantly driven as highlighted through grocery, the value and the pharmacy sectors over the past 12 months. One of the things that has evolved very nicely for us and we've spent a lot of time, effort and energy is ensuring brand penetration. And this is a summary of the current brands that we have on the market and the brands that we have been evolving and developing over the past few years. As you can see, we have got quite a spread of brands in different categories and at different price points. So now doing very well in the skincare category, good offerings within Bath and Body, Feather and Down doing very well for us in the wellbeing category, hair care very strong for us at all levels, and then our bronze ambition category in uh, brand in self-tan. What is key with all of these brands is that we continue to keep focused on the consumer need and consumer trend. So the heart of all of these brands, we're cruelty free, vegan friendly, microplastics free. We're moving to PCR plastic where possible in all of these brands. We're using recyclable packaging where possible and where available. We have moved all of our secondary gift packaging to be plastic free. And we keep the key themes of affordable beauty that is consumer trend and data led. To support the spread of brands and the brand penetration that we have, we continue to win significant awards in the industry. And this is just one example of awards that we won in the past couple of months. And in fact, just in the past couple of weeks, we've had some more awards. What was really nice about this one is that we won best UK beauty brand, which I think is a real accolade for the core Crichton's brand and demonstrates 
the consumer awareness of the Crichton's brand within the UK market. This particular group of awards is consumer voted, which we always value more than panels because the consumer is really telling us what it is that they value and the products that they like. But in addition to winning Best UK Beauty Brand, as you can see, we won an award in Balance, in Feather and Down, in Pure Touch, in Humble and in our hair care range. So that brand prenotation is still delivering for us in terms of consumer awareness and the consumer really enjoying the product that we're putting on the market. And I think for us, what is exciting about these awards is it's a reinforcement that the product that we're putting on the market is appealing to the consumer at the price points that we're putting onto the market, but also in terms of the quality of the formulations that we're delivering for the consumer. Digital is clearly a very strong subject for anybody that is owning and managing brands. And the past 12 months has seen a considerable acceleration of the consumer accessing digital channels to purchase product. So we have 164% uplift from last year in terms of our brands being sold through digital mediums. Our goal over the coming year and future years is to have a much wider strategy when it comes to digital. What we have recognized is that this category of accessibility and channel for the consumer is evolving very, very quickly. So it is about looking at every platform and every opportunity to get the product through to the consumer on a digital platform, which I'll outline in a minute. Um, one of the things that we've definitely done over the past six months in particular is we've invested quite significantly in resource in-house for social media. A big recognition on our part that in order to get product not only listed with traditional bricks and mortar um, retailers, but also onto platforms digitally, is social media is the absolute pinnacle of, of how you achieve that. It's the new advertising. It's the new way to communicate with the consumer. And we've made some great strides forward over the past few months in terms of investing in social media and have more team members joining over the coming months to ensure that we're keeping up with everything that's changing and moving on in terms of social media platforms. We've advanced quite considerably in terms of our knowledge of Amazon over the past 12 months to the extent that we now have a dedicated in-house team just focusing on Amazon. We have changed our thinking insofar as that we now treat them and manage them like any other account in the business. So we apply all the disciplines that we do with all of our bricks and mortar retailers to Amazon, including how we monitor quality, how we manage service levels, how we manage EPOS in terms of sales, stock levels, trends, focusing on top sellers, really gear changed in terms of our performance with Amazon over the past 12 months. And that's beginning to pay dividends for us as well. We have also, in particularly the past six months, achieved listings with key players in um, the digital space with Feather and Down launching on Next Beauty. We have four of our brands launching on To Feel Unique in the next two months. We have four of our brands currently on Boots. We're launching with Superdrug and we're also launching with Marks and Spencer. So we're getting a recognition that digital can be achieved in various ways, which I will just summarize on the next slide. So as we know, traditional offline retail, we have department stores, we have specialist beauty, we have high street fashion, we have pharmacy, we have grocery and discount grocery, and we have discount high street. And traditionally, this is how the consumer has accessed health and beauty. Online retail has changed dramatically in that we now have offline retailers online. So superdrug.com, for, for example, and nextbeauty.com doing very well. More recently, we have offline retailers like feelunique.com combining with Sephora. I don't know if you're aware that Sephora in the US recently purchased Feel Unique, which I think is a very interesting move to allow Sephora to access more of the digital space. You then have pure play beauty players like Look Fantastic or Beauty, Gorgeous Shop. There's many of them in the market. We have marketplaces like Amazon. Feel Unique are about to launch a marketplace. And then we obviously have direct-to-consumer where we're selling direct through platforms like Crichton's.com. Our goal is to ensure that we're getting good coverage in every single one of these digital arenas in order to get the product accessible to the consumer. So traditionally, where she was only accessing it from blicks and mortar, she is now able to access it digitally, which is giving her more choice. It is allowing her to access brands that aren't necessarily national brands. So she's got more choice on niche brands and on trend. And we're just ensuring that we're in this space and that we're moving quite nicely and ensuring that our consumer can access 
all of our brands and our, our brands that we're developing both offline and online. Our drivers for growth moving forward, those of us that know us well, uh, this has not changed over the past couple of years. And I think they are still completely right for how we're driving our business forward. We've had quite a significant investment in our branded sales team over the past 18 months. That has driven our brand sales momentum, particularly in the UK, significantly. The coverage that we're now reaching in terms of our brands, in terms of distribution, is really getting quite exciting in terms of where we are and where we're appearing. We're still continuing to partner with winning brands and retailers, both on the private label and the contract manufacturing side. Acquisitions is a very key driver for us moving forward, as Bernard highlighted in his introduction, focusing on brands that add value and businesses that add value to what we're already doing. As highlighted, new distribution channels have come on stream. We've now got some of our brands into the convenience sector. We're still doing very well in the TV shopping sector. And as I've already highlighted, working with e-commerce platforms quite significantly too. Cannot forget global, still a very important driver for us. It has slowed down during the pandemic just because of accessibility of people and product and trade shows through that period. However, still a very important focus for us. We have some key customers in global markets that are performing very well and still remains a, a key priority. And then ongoing digital development, our social media investment is absolutely a priority for us as we continue to move forward with our brands. So what is next in terms of opportunities and challenges? A lot has happened in the past 12 months. What I've tried to indicate here is where we have opportunities and where we've got pressures that we need to actively get ahead of to ensure success. So hygiene and health has definitely come on the agenda quite significantly. Whilst hygiene is definitely off the boil in terms of products related to sanitants and hand washes specifically, healthcare has become a very key issue for many, many consumers. So products within the healthcare sector are definitely coming front and center now in terms of what consumers are looking to purchase. And that goes hand in hand with well-being and self-care products. The time that people have spent at home and the issue of health has become so prevalent that it has changed the profile of the types of products that the consumers are looking to purchase. That then fits nicely into skincare and body care, which are probably two of the most dynamic growth categories that we're seeing across all sectors and each of our three pillars at Crichton's. Skincare is on fire in terms of what the consumer wants to purchase at all levels, whether that be a 199 core skincare line or whether that be a 45 pound premium cleansing product or very advanced moisturizing product. Body care is really, really advancing as well in terms of new terminologies you'll be hearing like the skinification of lots of categories. So lots of skincare trends, for example, are moving into hair care and moving into other categories. So very, very important. But those top three points are all very linked. D2C has obviously fast tracked quite considerably during the past 12 months. And I've outlined all of the digital platforms and our goal to ensure that we take advantage of all of those digital platforms, not just our own D2C, but also making sure that we're participating and get our, our brands launched and marketing on all platforms. Convenience shopping has performed unbelievably well. And as I highlighted earlier, we've managed to get some of our Crichton's core lines, both hair care and skin care, listed with some convenience chains over the past 12 months. And we're going to continue to pursue that objective to ensure that our brands have great facings and exposure within that channel. And then sustainability opportunities, which you'll see I also have on the other half of the of the chart here. It is offering opportunities, but it is also presenting considerable challenges. And it's presenting challenges insofar as that many of the packaging and supply chain raw material suppliers that we obviously have to work with to, to address these challenges are struggling themselves to find solutions. PCR is a very interesting one where the government is putting in a tax that if you don't have plastics with at least 30% PCR by the 1st of April next year, there's going to be a tax that's implemented. The problem we have in this country is that the availability of PCR doesn't quite match up to the demand that is in the market. Now, there are obviously various programs that are happening to challenge that and deal with that, but it is presenting a challenge to the whole industry. But there are many, many opportunities, and those opportunities are obviously to differentiate our brands in terms of moving forward with sustainability. 
And one of the areas that we're looking at is biodegradability with regard to raw materials. This appears to be something when we do our consumer research that resonates very well with the consumer. So not only are they focused on packaging and obviously plastics is at the top of the list, they're very aware of the raw materials and if you like what goes inside the bottle and what impact that has on our water courses and what that has on the environment. So you'll see that some of our brands are moving forward with claims with regard to biodegradability on ingredients. How we win with all of these challenges and these opportunities is staying true to the introduction that I made in terms of who we are and what we are, quality, innovation and service at the heart of it. It's important that we have strong narrative with our brands. Every single one of our brands needs to talk to consumers in a way that we truly are making sure that the products that we're supplying are meeting a need and a want and a desire. It's very important that at every level, whether it's a £1.99 product or a £45 product, that those products deliver value. Agility and adaptability within our business at all levels, including manufacturing, development, the way that we manage our customers, the product opportunities that we take, transferring, for example, into the NHS when we were faced with probably one of the biggest challenges of the century is just an example of how we need to keep agility and adaptability at the heart of everything that we do. And then providing solutions, again, no matter what the business is that we're doing, whether it's products to the consumer, whether it's services on contract manufacturing to key brands, whether or not it's private label options to our retailers, that we're constantly providing solutions and offering solutions to all of our customers and all of our consumers. So that's the end of my marketing presentation. And I'm going to hand back to Bernard, who is going to highlight some conclusions and some thoughts on the way forward. Thank you very much, Pippa. And thank you, Eamon. I hope everybody was suitably um, impressed with that or motivated. Um, by the way, I see 83% fell asleep quicker than normal in my little uh, caption at the back there. Please don't take that literally. This is good stuff, and we're, this is the bit I love to talk about, the way ahead. We want to keep the momentum going, and it's all about selling a product, but you can't sell it until you manufacture it, and you can't manufacture it until you develop it. And over the last 12 years, just let me give you a little bit of background here. Martin, our chief technical officer, has probably been instrumental in developing 6,000 products for our brands, for Tesco, for Boots. He's probably won 40 awards for those products and never has any one of them failed. So I want to put investment and more resources into making sure that we have the ability to develop our own brands and brands for uh, third parties, whether they be brand owners or whether it be high street retailers or whether they be big digital platforms. And it's very tax efficient as well because at the moment we're probably, we benefit from about 300,000 a year in tax relief through our, our expenditure on investment, but it has paid off seriously. And we do have, and we'll continue to invest in high caliber chemists, brand managers and leaders. So external recruitment, internal training, underpinned by a graduate trainee scheme, that's our key in that area to continue with what Martin has been doing brilliantly over, the, over a number of years. And secondly, we want to acquire third-party higher margin brands. We do this on a well-researched basis and we're going about it very seriously. We've set up a team that are doing all the work necessary to identify these brands, to evaluate them and to bring them to a point where we can exercise a purchase. And we, we're generating cash. We're generating cash on a very healthy basis. But if you generate three or four million cash a year and you don't use it, you're going to be in trouble with your return on capital. So we've got that message and we've got the ability to execute on it. So you will see the results of this in, in the oncoming year. Eamon has also negotiated extended bank facilities. So not only do we generate cash, but we can use extended bank facilities if the opportunities become available. In terms of investment, we can also sell off some land we have probably five acres in our site which is increasing in value every year we bought it about two years ago 
And uh, we worked out that we could sell off five acres, which is a, a substantial amount of cash. Again, we can use it either investing in manufacturing facilities, efficiencies, and automation, or we can use it to acquire brands. In the short term, we're looking at three or four brands, which are totaling at least 12 million. And that will produce, as I said, in the not too distant future. We are aiming at brands with at least 50% on a digital platform. In other words, brands that sell half of what they do on other Amazon, Feel Unique, uh, Look Fantastic, Cult Beauty, Beauty Bay, all, all of those uh, digital platforms. And even more exciting than all that, we want to develop the private label and contract business over the next three years. Uh, we've got the, the right man to lead it in Nick Coleman, who will tell you about himself very shortly in question time. And we will invest in automation, flexibility, which is very important when you're facilitating private label business. We need to green the business. Uh, it's a general term, but it means a lot in terms of the audits we have, the ethical audits, the sustainability audits, which are becoming more and more strict as time goes on. We're investing in training and development right across the board and strengthening the sales team. And basically, we are extending our intended recruitment of people who can work globally. We intend to extend our global reach and private label and contract business well and truly outside the UK. We already are pretty strong in the Middle East, but there's a lot more to go for. And I don't think there's anybody better placed than us to go for it. We will invest in digital marketing and technology. We will also invest in uh, developing our ability to use digital platforms and be listed on them. So for example, if we want to be listed on Feel Unique or we want to be listed on Look Fantastic, which are very powerful retailers at the moment, we have to have say 50,000 Instagram followers. Well, you know, I'm a bit old to be on Instagram and and but, there are lots of people who know how to do it, and I can assure you we will have those on board very quickly so that all of our brands will have very strong uh, digital uh, presence and media presence. Summing that up and talking about the future, what, what excites me is that we have the ability in the next three years to drive through the 100 million mark. And momentum means a lot in this business. You know, It means that if you're doing 60 million, we can expect 8% in the bottom line. When you're doing 100 million just naturally, and I've seen it as we grew from 10 million to 60 million, we can get to 10% on the bottom line without a big problem. We are going to build and strengthen the senior management team. We have already brought Eamon on board as the financial director. He's done a great job. Um, we brought Nick Coleman on board. He's done a great job. And we're talking to other people in the media sector and the Instagram <laughs> media sector that will develop our ability to market and sell to those digital platforms. As I've said before, we'll acquire brands which in the next three years, which will total 20 million, probably at least 20 million. And that will be part of our drive towards a 50 million brand portfolio. And those uh, acquisitions will enhance our margin and improve our digital momentum just by the fact that they're already there and they already have a, a good margin. And as I said, we want to invest heavily in automation, efficiency, capacity, and manufacturing to facilitate the private label market and also the contract manufacturing. We want to target uh, the ability to meet MHRA standards in the UK and FDA standards in the, in the USA. And I do that because I think we can do drug-based creams and lotions on our machinery just by a little bit more investment in the environment in which they're produced. And that brings us into a totally different category with much higher margins. We're well able to do that, and we will do it within the next three years. So I have no doubt that we, put, just as we delivered on the 60 million by 2021, by the end of 20, 2024, um, we, we'd be pushing well through the 100 million mark with a very healthy bottom line, a good dividend, and, uh, uh, and, and generating cash. We may be spending that cash on more and more acquisitions, but we will be generating it on an operational basis. In numbers terms, this aspiration will translate, looking at history, 2020, 48 million turnover to 2021, we did 62, and in the future, 2024, 100 million. EBITDA, 
at least 12 and a half percent by 2024 um which is a good improvement on the uh, on the 2020 and still an improvement on 2021 that's the very least i would expect by 2024 net profit again will go from 7.4% right through to 10% in 2024 our branded sales and this is key to our acquisition strategy they'll go from 10.3 million excluding hygiene i'm not taking hygiene into this because hygiene was a need and a, and, a, and a wise decision at the time, but there's more hygiene in the UK than will facilitate the whole world for about four years. So we are focusing on other things at the moment. Uh, we're up to 12 million now on our own core brands and we'll move to 40 million plus by 2024. That's on the basis of a strong acquisition pinpoint strategy, which uh, will be implemented. Let, let me explain it because it, it sounds a bit ridiculous what I'm repeating over and over again. But for the last year, we've been diverted. You know, we had momentum. We had great, we had great growth right up until COVID. We maintained that momentum through COVID, but it took our eye off the main core business. Uh, so we've reestablished that and we're now back out there with the core brands, the skin care, the hair care, the tanning to, uh, to uh, re reestablish that momentum through organic growth and through acquisition. Uh, contract manufacturing uh, uh, under under the leadership of, of um, our team, particularly with Nick on board, will, I have no doubt, move from 12.3 million to 30 million. We will have in there some drug-based uh, MHRA approved or FDA approved uh, uh, products. We may even develop our own brands in those drug-based uh, creams and lotions, but that's where we're going, and I no doubt we'll get there uh, by 2024. Our private label sales are at the moment languishing compared to last year. It's certainly not. It's certainly all hard work and and good good work by us, but I think we'll move very quickly to 30 million because we we are not only extending our ability to manufacture competitively in every area, but we're expen extending our presence in the, in the sun care, uh, tanning, uh, hair care, all of those areas. Every, every month that goes by, every year that goes by, we extend that and we'll continue to do it because we have a good core team and a good core philosophy. Lastly, our digital brand sales um, will, will uh, increase. That's already included in the 40 million but what I'm trying to say is that part of mo a lot of that 40 million will be sold on Look Fantastic, Feel Unique, Beauty Bay, all those digital platforms. It's not direct to consumer, but it's direct to a, a place where the consumer buys on a digital platform. No doubt that we have the ability to do this. Uh, uh, and uh, my only regret is that I'm not 30 years younger that can't put out uh, 30, 2034 so we can see a when we're going to hit the billion mark. But anyway, that's the end of my presentation on that. And I think we're now ready for questions, if I'm not mistaken. And we already have loads of questions. So um, the first question, what capacity headroom do you currently have? And how easy is it to scale up further? Good question. Um, maybe I should hand it over to Nick, first of all. He, he he hasn't been with us so long, so I'll qualify whatever he answers. If he's wrong, I'll I'll tell you. <laughs> but it would be an opportunity for Nick to introduce himself, his background, and what he intends to do with this company in the longer term. Over to you, Nick. Yeah, sure, Bernard. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, and good afternoon to all of you. And I'm uh, very pleased to join you for what's uh, my my first results meeting at uh, at Crichton's. So as a quick uh, introduction in terms of my background. Um, I joined the business uh, officially a couple of months ago, but unofficially around eight months ago as a, a remote consultant. Uh, I was working out in North America at the time. Um, and I've been in the uh, premium beauty sector for, for about 25 years now. In the UK, I've worked for uh, Swallowfield PLC, uh, spent many years running uh, production operations and developing the UK's largest contract manufacturing skincare site at uh, LF Beauty, uh, part of the Liam Fong Group. And in 2016, I was asked to get involved in a, a business restructure and, and scaling of another Lian Fong owned um, business based out of uh, New York in pharmaceutical, oral care, 
um, and skincare. And then prior to returning to the UK, I completed a, a Toronto-based um, scaling uh, project for uh, LEC Custom Products, who are one of the fastest growing skincare manufacturers in Canada now. I finally got my feet on the ground at Potter and Moore to support Bernard and the team in the, the next phases of growth. Uh, I think there's tremendous potential at, uh, at both sites. Um, and in fact, we've already started to, to execute numerous um, smart projects to increase the agility of existing equipment. So we'll start to see greater efficiencies there. And I'm also looking at uh, site developments that will lead to space creation for additional capacity for the future. Uh, as well as fo focusing on uh, strategic uh, investment, it will really be designed in with uh, multiple capabilities so that we can handle more complex formulations and possibly business from uh, more highly regulated sectors that uh, Bernard was alluding to. There's also a huge effort underway um, uh, to drive tenured sort of quality talent into operations and engineering uh, of the business and uh, also looking at um, homegrown talent as well and we're going to develop an apprenticeship scheme so that we've got uh, grassroots coming up through as well which is very important for the future. We're also considering our responsibilities as manufacturer to drive sustainability and, and greening, uh, greening across the business. So we're, we're reviewing our uh, potential improvements to consumption of critical services, so air, power, steam, gas, in terms of uh, infrastructure. But that's alongside um, the work that's already being done uh, to drive in uh, sustainability into the, the uh, supply chain uh, with um, post-consumer recycled plastics that can be uh, used in the bottles and, and plastic caps and so on that we convert. So, so Bern has given me a lot to go at, but I feel that our, uh, I'm, I'm confident that our strategy of driving flexibility, automation, uh, skills, and, and general business agility will uh, deliver the right support uh, to the, the growth of the business. So yeah, glad to be um, part of the, uh, uh, the team and, and, and look forward to answering your questions. Um, in, in terms of the, um, the question on, uh, on capacity, it's uh, we, we, it, it's it probably is too early for me to give you a, a, a very accurate answer, uh, but what I can say is um, that there is excess capacity to be had um, in both sites. Um, we're doing a tremendous amount of work in the Devon facility at the moment to tease out some uh, early additional capacity. Uh, I think our, our uh, initial plans that we're executing on smaller capex uh, uh, projects, which are, many of which are underway, uh, will deliver short-term increases. Um, longer term, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm looking at the Peterborough site and the Devon site um, for opportunities to drive in additional capacity so that we can uh, we can leverage uh, you know more more products uh, out of both sites. Um, so um, I don't know whether Amy, uh, whether um, Bernard, do you want to add anything anything else to that? No, I, I, I couldn't. Just one tiny point. Uh, we're, we're, I, I want us to become known as Crichton's rather than Potter and Moore in the manufacturing area, uh, but we we are uh, we are seen and known as Potter and Moore, but uh, as we establish the Crichton's brand and the corporate value of the Crichton's brand, I think we'll, we'll talk more about that. But in terms of capacity, you know, simple things like we're on two shifts, we can't go to three shifts. We can, we have room to put in more machinery, have the money to buy more machinery if we want to. Um, uh, we, we had three shifts this time last year to manufacture those uh, uh, hand gels. We did 14 million probably uh, 14 million units uh, um, inside about a four month period last year starting from scratch uh, so so we have the ability and the, the flexibility within the team to do it we have the money to do it we have the area to do it and we're still on only one one and a half shifts really we could go to three shifts hopefully that answers the question thank you and moving on to staffing is that a significant production constraint and are you managing to fulfill orders in a manner to keep the customers happy? Well, I'll, I'll have the first go at that. We are mm. we are keeping the customers happy. They're almost ecstatic, but um, it, we do recognize the dangers. The customers are, themselves, the retailers particularly, are suffering the same issues as we are. The shortage of drivers, for example, the, the difficulty in trans shipping from China mm. and from the UK. Um, all of those things, but Pippa might want to qualify that or, or or Nick. Yeah, I mean, just to add to what you said, Bernard, we are delivering on time to customers. 
where we are having issues, as you've highlighted, with global transport, which is hitting everybody. Um, we're negotiating with customers. There's leeway in the system at the moment because everybody's facing the same issues. But it's not hitting consumers and it's not hitting stores yet in terms of our category. Um, we hold healthy buffer stocks for core customers, which enables us to have that agility to flex if we need to. Um, and we work very closely with our customers on forecasting and depot stock management and all of those good things that make sure we keep ahead of it and out in front. Um, we have had a few instances where customers themselves are prioritizing the stock that they want. Customers uh, definitely are, as Bernard's highlighted, are having driver issues. It's a big, big problem in the UK since Brexit. Um, and the pandemic is not happening, helping that situation. Um, good news is private label gets prioritized a lot with most retailers. So that's always a positive for us. Um, and we are on backhaul with a lot of the retailers as well. So we do get priority in terms of that. So, yeah, I, there, there's no issues currently in terms of keeping customers happy and orders delivered. And the other issue that a lot of people have been talking about is the impact of inflation on raw materials. And what's your ability to raise prices to, re to cover those? Go ahead, Pippa. You, you take first go with that. Um, interestingly, private label and contract businesses are a lot easier to have conversations with customers in terms of pricing. Um, there's often a more educated customer that we're dealing with that understands the pressures and obviously they see it in all aspects of what's happening in the industry same with transport um so there are dialogues going on all the time the area where it becomes more challenging on pricing is with our own brands only because it's easier for a retailer to push back quite hard on brands and they expect you to absorb however on the upside, we're in control of our own brands. So we have the ability to cost engineer, we have the ability to resource, we're sort of masters of our own destiny when it comes to our own brands. So I think in, in all cases, we keep an eye on those margins constantly and tackle each of those issues as they, as they address and try and keep out in front of it as well. Thank you. And in the interim presentation, you alluded to bringing in house and warehousing. Is that proceeding? Uh, to a limited extent, it's proceeding. Uh, uh, long term, it will be. A, 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 it's a long ter longer term goal than just overnight. Um, so uh, in the last six months, we have limited in-house uh, warehousing and, and bringing back uh, our picking and packing. Uh, but we have done probably 10% of, of the total. Uh, and uh, over the next two years, we intend to extend that to more like 100%. But it depends, you know, if we grow more quickly than expected, that's one area that we can, that we can be flexible. And if it's interfering with the main operation, it might cost an extra 100,000 or 200,000 a year. But in terms of increasing, if you're increasing your turnover by a million on the bottom line, it doesn't make a lot of difference. We're just flexible on that and, and we will continue as a goal. Thank you. Um, concerning the inventory write down, does this concern mostly retail products or NHS product or both, or are they the same products supplied to both? Yeah, if I can just just answer that. So, so the inventory provision that we're referring to in the preliminary it relates to the uh, the hand sanitizers and the hand gels for the most part. And that's almost wholly in the retail sector. All of the NHS commitments were taken. Yeah, in yeah. Retail. And they're not the same pro and they're not the same products just to clarify the specs are different and someone's asking about the ebit margin on hygiene sales well it it it, it was healthy but we've now replaced that with healthier or just as healthy other sales if that answers your question thank you and could you explain the impact of the invoice financing surplus on your balance sheet is this in receivables and what's the source of the increase in accrued income the invoice sur surplus that just re that just refers uh, to the cash that we have received into the invoice um, uh, financing account that we hadn't we hadn't taken into our own account by the year end. That's all. That's all that refers to. So it's our cash entirely entirely within our control. We have we at the year end we had um, uh, seven seven million in basically undrawn undrawn invoice financing uh, facilities which we which we didn't need to utilize. Thank you. And what proportion of last year's 1.6 million COVID costs do you expect to recur this year, assuming cases continue to abate? Yeah, good. A really good question. Um, what, 
we had hoped by this stage to reduce it to almost nil. Um, we probably uh, more than halved at the moment. Um, it depends on how things go from here. It, it's a very unpredictable pandemic, uh, but I would expect us to have still um, a hangover or whatever you call it, um, a, a cost of COVID probably about uh, 15 to 20% of what we had this time last year. But it depends on how the, this this pandemic works and uh, what what uh, leeway the government gives gives us and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. You know, at this moment in time, if one person has COVID, then we have to send home everybody that has had contact with them or who's pinged, and we usually have to pay them. Uh, although we're probably going to start not paying anybody who hasn't had a job, one job at least, or two jobs. But it's that it's that kind of variable. Think we might find that you know it's illegal to do that. I think it's fair to do it, but it may be illegal. Um, but at this moment in time, we are still hit by the pandemic, and we still pay people that we have to force into isolation. If particularly production people who can't work from home, that is a cost. And how's the ERP system progressing? The ERP system, we have started an internal uh, project team uh, with a view to replacing our ERP uh, system. Probably over the medium term, we'd expect to have um, a new ERP system in place. Just the system we have is functioning is functioning well. It's well tried and tested. It does the nuts and bolts of the business successfully every day. It's supported. So it's it's not it's not a system that's going to fall down overnight or over the next couple of years. But certainly looking into the medium longer term, um, you know, we recognize we need to get something that that'll stand us in in good stead for the distant for the distant future so it's a project that started and ongoing we're looking at a number of options lots of good products out on the marketplace i mean i, I would say our requirements in terms of erp if you think about our business uh, are not that different from many manufacturing and process business so it's not like we're trying to reinvent a wheel and bring in a specialist bespoke system that uh, requires extensive programming um, and su and support we are in terms of what we're doing on the manufacturing side, the nuts and bolts have taken in product, processing it, putting it into stock, converting that into debtors, uh, invoicing cash. That whole cycle is 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 um, is um, similar to what a lot of companies are doing. So it's it's something that we we'll, we will we will tackle and tackle well. And I'm very confident we'll have a good solution. But it's it's not something that uh, I feel we need to do this year or next year. It's not like I have a burning platform that we need to address. So so we'll do it. We'll do it well, and uh, we'll do it in our in our own good time. Thank you. And looking at the aspiration for 2025, how much of the 100 million target is expected from sustainable organic growth of existing lines and how much from entirely new lines? Hey, good question. Um, I think I, I stated there at least 20 million would be from uh, acquisitions. Um, I think we, we need to do at least 20 million uh, acquisitions to hit that, but to hit the 100 million uh, by the end of 2024. If you're talking about 2025, I noticed you mentioned 2025. <laughs> Maybe you're giving me an extra year to achieve that, but I'll take it if you, if you are. But we should, we should be, we should probably make at least 20 million pounds worth of acquisitions by the end of uh, 2024. I, I'm very confident about that. I'm confident we can identify the acquisitions. I, I, I'm confident we can negotiate a good price and I'm confident we're going to execute. Thank you. Um, and on acquisitions, could you tell investors why you decided not to pursue the Inno Verderma acquisition? It, it was a very serious bid um, and, and we didn't, uh, uh, we, we're governed by the laws of the stock exchange. Uh, we didn't want to up the offer, the offer was very good. In fact, if you look historically at the offer, it was huge because their share price is still 30, 32 P and ours is, is 90 plus. Um, so uh, I don't know, uh, we, we, they certainly lost out. I, I think we lost out because it's a really good brand. It would take us into a, a digitally platformed brand with also high street presence. Um, it also has FDA approval and other other products as well, which are peripheral really to to its turnover. But uh, we 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 can't make another offer for a number of months. I think uh, I need to check that. But 
but right now we've other fish to fry. You know, if if it doesn't, if it didn't materialize, we can't hang about uh, wringing our hands for another six months. Um, we're out there after other things. And um, could you confirm that you will not consider acquisitions that might dilute your commitment to quality or verifiable performance? I can absolutely. I, I don't know what is the is the uh, reason or the inspiration for that question but uh you know no question about that we're about quality uh and performance uh, if a product doesn't perform we'll actually pay to have it brought back in house i mean that's the thing about Mart martin's going to talk about this i want to give martin a chance to talk he's a man who's developed six thousand products and he doesn't bear fools gladly or let anything out there that doesn't perform martin have a shot uh yeah Bern is right uh you know we we have a, a very strong product development process in-house, which also involves uh, you know, a very deep-rooted risk analysis process. And that, that covers the quality of the product, the safety of the product, the claims that can be made on a product. Everything is given you know, scrupulous detail. And um, you know, Bernard talked about acquisitions as well. We, we apply the same tools and uh, examination of anything that we, we we look at or are thinking of purchasing and you know i i've got an incredible team of chemists that uh, were highly in innovative and uh you know have helped us to uh to get to the to the stage where we are at the moment you know alongside pippa's great sales team and um yeah it's uh you know it's very exciting times for us and uh you know, we we do have strong team. We have strong systems to to take us forward and to uh, develop further products. Well, I, I think I agree entirely. Endorse what Martin says. We wouldn't we wouldn't consider wouldn't even want, want to consider uh, something that doesn't perform. I, I just don't. Maybe I don't understand the question, right? Or you've answered perfectly, Bernard. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Moving on on acquisitions, what return on invested capital do you target for M and A pre and post potential synergies? Yeah, yeah. So, so obviously we assess the, we assess the acquisitions on a number of criteria, but you know we'd 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 um, you know the. the return on capital um multiple multiple of ebitda just will be you know something like five times 20 you percent know, or whichever way you want to, you want to look at some something something in that or we wouldn't be doing acquisitions that is going to dilute our ret return on re existing return on capital employed and uh, obviously before we do acquisitions we'll have a careful look of you know what savings what synergies we can uh, we can achieve you know which will be in in the nature of you know uh, what what uh, operational savings can we make within the business what manufacturing synergies uh, can we can we access uh, so by you know for example by taking manufacturing in house uh, what's the potential for top line sales growth uh, and expansion and we put those into our into our assessment model and um, you know ho hopefully we 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 won't be we won't be proposing uh, anything that as i say that'll be diluting that diluting capital when we do those uh, criteria if you if you looked at it, if we're looking to do twelve and a half million EBITDA on one hundred million in in three years time, that's that's eight times. So uh, the most we'd ever pay, I think, for anything with with um, anything decent uh, would be five times EBITDA. Uh, so I don't see any danger of us diluting return on capital on that principle. I hope that answers the question. Modeling question. What's a reasonable number to use for the long-term annual growth in share count due to share incentives, which the, the writer says I fully support? Would it be 1% to 2%? I, I think it would. I, I think we would also add to that probably 5% uh, or, or within that would be uh, another 3% to add to 5% to use as paper in acquisitions. So, um, you know, in, in the Innova Derma case, we were offering paper. I, I can't remember exactly what we, we offered, but part of it was paper. Um, uh, and and uh, at that time, the price was about 45p. So they would have done well. Their paper would be worth 89p, but our shareholders would have been slightly diluted. Um, so I expect to use paper to do 
part, part, part of the 20 million, probably um, I, I, I wouldn't expect the dilution over those three years to be much more than five, one percent a year for employees and probably three percent, four percent in total for um, for, for uh, paper acquisition. Great, thank you. And the question on the um, return on invested capital on mergers and acquisitions is um, asking, is the five times EBITDA M&A price before synergies? No. After, but, but you know, five times uh, EBITDA would be, would, would be the most we'd ever pay. And we need to be fairly certain we can achieve those synergies. <laughs> but it is after synergies. And before? Well, if there is no synergies, we wouldn't even bother. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that that's a fair question, but before, I mean, if, if there's three times EBITDA and it's a strong performing brand that has no further synergies, it certainly would be worth buying uh, at that price, assuming that the EBITDA has, has got some, like, it's, it's a million or, or something like that. But if it's something or a brand around a hundred thousand with any, but uh, with um, and we and we can buy it for three hundred thousand, I wouldn't be bothered. I think it's I think probably the other point about the before EBITDA as well as we you know we're not in control of the before EBITDA so there are circumstances within businesses going on that are that that are outside our control and you know there could be exceptional there could be once off events there could be specific reasons why businesses are doing what they're doing from a trading point of view so so we we look at those we take them into account and uh, we we do our, we do our own assessment tremendous thank you and can you discuss what the big change in business margin and return on capital employed was in 2016. The performance has been remarkable since then. Well, uh, we started to move up the uh, margin ladder. For example, we bought a brand, Balance Active, which uh, uh, it was turned over half a million a couple of years, a few years ago, and it now turns over two million and on its way to three million. Its margin has improved, and it is it is a lot it is a lot higher than the average margin in 2016. That's just one example, um, but we do we do try deliberately to move up the margin ladder with all the products, both private label, contract, and um, uh, and, and our own brands. Pippa, would you like to add to that? I mean, I, I agree with you completely, Bernard. I, I think one of the things that happened operationally and behind the scenes with my team is that we did a shift from focusing on gross margins to contribution margins. And we did that throughout the entire business. And that made a marked input on how my teams were measured and how they measured the products that they were delivering. So a lot can happen below a gross margin that impacts on on the margin. And all we talk about in the business now on a commercial level is contribution margins. And we hold that at quite a high level to force ourselves all the time to ensure that that's the priority and that's what we're working on to improve. So that was a very operational day-to-day thing that happened. Bern is quite right that um, the purchase of Balance Active made a big contribution to that. And I think as a business, we just became more focused on what would drive the improvement in those margins and at every level in the business commercially from bottom all the way up. And it, it it's just driven improvement in the margins all the way through. I think we became... I think we also became less tolerant of products that weren't performing insofar as that we did more reviews ourselves and were quite happy to kind of cut business that was not profitable business and good margin business and replace it with with different types of it. So I suppose more confidence in our abilities came at that time as well. Yeah, it, it also, uh, we, you know, reflecting on it, I mean, it's a surprise question, so I didn't have time to look at it, but... Um, we also bought Broad Oak, which is now Potter Moore Devon at that time, which brought us into a different category of, of customer, higher higher margin and and more to do with fragrance and, and so on. Um that, that has su- that that particular sector has suffered a bit during COVID, but we will get back in there again. It's an area that Nick particularly is familiar with. But that is another factor. Uh, you, there were several factors. We we decided to cut out low margin products, made a massive effort to do that as pippa has said we 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 were benefiting at that stage from the the what used to be broad oak and is now pottermore devon we bought it out of administration and um, 
just those other things that we've talked about, the balance active and so on. Excellent. Thank you. And what's the normalised level of capital expenditure as a percentage of revenues? I, I think we're going to have to, if we want to move up uh, into the higher echelons of contract manufacturing, we're going to have to spend $2 million in the next 18 months. Um, part of that we've started. Um, and the turnover there is somewhere in the region of, say, uh, six hundred million, so it's it's three percent anyway, three to four percent. Eamon, uh, 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 do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's an indication. We we did, for example, spend a, give or take a million in 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 capex in the, in the in the year gone out just to put those numbers into context. Thank you. You've got an incredible story that's not widely told. Are there any plans to get analyst coverage to help get the story out there, which might help you get better M and A currency? We're we're a corporate we're a corporate and we meet all the rules of the stock exchange, but we have a an entrepreneurial side to us as well. I think which I want to continue to foster. Um, you know, I'll have to move out somewhere in the not too distant future, but. And it'll be time to bring analysts in then. But I think we create our own story as we go along. And um, I don't want anybody telling a story a certain way. You know, we tell the story as we see it. Well, I tell it as I see it. And uh, I want to continue that until it's time to hang up the boots. But if we need an analyst, we have an analyst. Thank you, Bernard. And where are this land sales going to be? And will it be for commercial use or residential development? Oh, that's a very detailed question. Uh, the fact is, we've got an eleven-acre site, um, and and we're we're we are are pretty careless about the way we use it in the sense that um, we could we could actually we probably use six acres of it. We probably could use four acres and be even more efficient because sometimes being able to set things in, in empty spaces is a way to lead to inefficiency. So uh, confining ourselves to um, uh, uh, five acres um, will, would be a good thing. Um, I think we want to be able to produce 100 million w within the same footprint as we have now by buying higher speed machinery, uh, robotic robots, and all the all the good stuff that Nick I think will 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 provide for us. Um, so uh, the five uh, the the you know I I just sell it to any developer. I don't care if he builds houses on it. Or castles, or or um, whatever, but it's not a complicated picture. It's just a way to raise money to buy brands or to uh, improve our ability to do drug-based uh, contract manufacturing for GSK or whoever else is out there looking for it. Thank you. And do you expect sales growth in 2021 despite hygiene headwinds? And do you expect margin growth in 2022 year on year? I would definitely expect to pull the margins that we've been doing on our products. There is there is some headwinds and pressure on pricing. However, I think our team are doing a phenomenal job of keeping ahead of it, not in ter both in terms of how we're purchasing, but also in terms of how we are managing price increases with customers. So we have to play both sides of that coin. I think that will be a positive result for us. We are getting good organic sales growth, particularly in our brands. Um, and yeah, the sales the sales growth organically is coming. And as Bernard has alluded, that if the acquisitions that we're currently reviewing come to fruition over the coming months, then that is definitely going to add to our growth in terms of sales. I don't think we see any issues there. Thank you. And that's the end of questions. Bernard, do you have any closing remarks? I'd like our, our audience to be confident that we're on the right track and we will continue to be on the right track. And we've got the right team. Uh, and we continue to build with that team. I want to thank everybody for spending time with us and for listening to what we have to say and being interested in us.